Good evening and welcome to Gravitas. I'm Palki Sharma Upadhyay. Let's get started. अनुच्छेद 370 के सभी खंड लागू नहीं होंगे सिवाय खंड के Thursday, the 5th of August. The day began with euphoria on social media. The Indian hockey team had won a medal, the first one in 41 years. Hockey is India's national sport. This was a long-awaited win. It should give a new lease of life to Indian sport in general and to hockey in particular. As we sat down to make the new news list for the day, we realized that India had struck more goals on August 5th. On the political field, the abrogation of Article 370 and the ushering of democracy in, or normalcy rather in Kashmir. On the geopolitical field, the sailing of warships to the South China Sea, a contested battlefield where India is not shy of flexing its muscle. These are all goals that cement India's position as a leading power. On Gravitas tonight, we'll discuss all of them in detail. Also on the show tonight, Ibrahim Raisi is now in charge of Iran. He was sworn in as president earlier today with India's external affairs minister in attendance. Where is New Delhi's relationship with Iran going? We'll analyze the growing proximity. In Afghanistan, the Bagram Air Base, once America's epicenter in its fight against the Taliban, now it resembles a ghost town. We get your ground report from there. What's the environmental cost of bottled water? A new report says its impact is 1,400 times more than the impact of tap water. We'll decode the findings for you. And in Ethiopia, the Tigray conflict is going from bad to worse. Dead bodies washing up in neighboring countries. Refugee camps on the brink of collapse. What is the government of Abiy Ahmed doing? We begin as always with Gravitas Global Headlines. Afghanistan's famous poet, Abdullah Atifi, killed by gunmen after being dragged out of his home in the Uruzgan province. The government blames the Taliban, but the terror group has denied the killing. Meanwhile, the European Union demands a permanent ceasefire in Afghanistan. The Pakistani charge of affairs um, in the High Commission here in Delhi was summoned today afternoon. India summons Pakistan's top diplomat in Delhi and lodges a strong protest over the mob attack on a Hindu temple in the Punjab province of Pakistan. The United States dismisses calls by the World Health Organization to delay COVID booster shots as poorer nations battle vaccine shortages. This as Germany, France and Israel have already started giving booster shots to their citizens. The United Kingdom will start offering a COVID-19 jab to all 16 and 17 year olds within weeks without the need for parental consent as advised by vaccine experts in the country. The Mexican government sues the biggest gun makers in the United States, accusing them of fueling bloodshed. The lawsuit alleges that these companies had full knowledge that they were contributing to illegal arms trafficking. The United States has proposed a $750 million weapon sale to Taiwan in a move that is likely to anger China. The U.S. State Department says the proposed sale is intended to strengthen Taiwan's self-defense capabilities. Coup hit Myanmar's ambassador to the United Nations alerts the world body to an alleged massacre committed by the military junta saying that 40 bodies had been found in northwestern Myanmar in July. 
summer of wildfires in Russia's Siberian region of Yakutia produce a record amount of carbon emissions as environmentalists warn of more weeks of fire season. There are fears that these fires may thaw the Siberian permafrost, releasing more carbon. The Indian men's hockey team has ended a 41-year wait to return to the Olympic podium after beating four-time champions Germany 5-4 in a thriller. The Indians fought back from 3-1 down in the bronze medal match via goals from Hardik Singh, Harman Preet Singh, Rupinder Pal Singh and Simranjit Singh. This is India's first medal in hockey since they won the last of their eight gold medals at the Moscow Games in 1980. But India's wait for only its second individual Olympic gold medal has continued with wrestler Ravi Dahia falling in the final on men's 57 kilogram category. Dahia was soundly beaten 7-4 by two-time world champion Zavar Yugev of Russia. He is India's second silver medalist of the Tokyo Games after Mirabai Shanu, but only the sixth in the country's Olympic history. Today is the 5th of August. It's a big day for India. All things hockey are trending on social media. A country of 1.3 billion people celebrating a bronze medal. The first one in more than four decades. Tonight on Gravitas, as we celebrate this victory, we want to revisit the many goals that India has scored on this day. Goals on the hockey field that won us a bronze medal. Goals on the political field that led to the abrogation of Article 317 Kashmir. Goals on the geopolitical field that led to an Indian warship sailing in the South China Sea. Tonight, we'll discuss all these goals. Starting with Kashmir, on this day, exactly two years back, India took a big step towards redefining its relationship with Jammu and Kashmir. The special status of JNK was nullified. The state was bifurcated into two union territories. Today is the second anniversary of that historic decision. The abrogation of Article 370 and 35A. Many had predicted a doomsday scenario. Thankfully, none of that happened. Tonight, we'll take stock of Kashmir. Two years since it embarked on a new path. Then we have hockey. India's stupendous performance at the Tokyo Olympics. The men's hockey team backed the bronze medal today. They defeated Germany 5-4 in a thrilling contest. They ended a 41-year-long wait for an Olympic medal in hockey for India. Goal number three on the high seas, telling adversaries that India means business. For the first time ever, India has sent a task force of four warships into the South China Sea. This will be a two-month deployment. Indian ships will participate in exercises with the United States, Japan and Australia. The message to China is clear. The alliance of democracies will push back against Chinese aggression. So on this day, 5th of August, India has three reasons to celebrate, three goals achieved. Number one, the return of normalcy to Jammu and Kashmir. Number two, India's best performance at the Olympics. And number three, India playing the role of a leading world power. We'll discuss all of it. We'll begin with Kashmir. Two years back on this day, India revoked Article 317, Jammu and Kashmir. A decision that put Kashmir at par with the rest of the country. A decision that put Kashmiris at par with the rest of Indians. India had every right to do so, it justified its need to do so, and yet there was an outpouring of rage aimed at India. I'm sure most of you will recall how the days that followed India's Kashmir decision were dominated by sensational headlines in the Western press. A commentary and reportage that was not only misleading but indulged in fear-mongering. There were a lot of predictions, a lot of prophecies on how this move would spell doom in Kashmir. Two years on, have any of these prophecies come true? The Independent, a British daily, carried this headline. The worst is yet to come, it said. This was on the 7th of August, 2019. Two years on, what's left to come? Perhaps an admission of their bias. The CNN carried this headline. New violence feared in old flashpoint. Two years on, where is the violence? Then we have The Guardian. It had this to say, India's cancellation of Kashmir's special status will have consequences. The report suggested that more and more Kashmiri youth will now pick up arms. Two years later, radicalization is on the decline in the valley. And then we have the Washington Post, which carried this headline, The Kashmir crisis is not about territory, it's about a Hindu victory over Islam. The story suggested that India will convert Kashmir into a Hindu state. Two years on, what happened to their prophecy? What happened to all these predictions? 
to all the theories that foresaw a doomsday in Kashmir. Today, as we look back, not only do these headlines undermine the credibility the Western media organizations hold so dearly, they also expose their prejudice and bias against India. Even now, their reports paint a grim picture of the existing situation in the valley. But here's something they will not tell you. India has proven its critics wrong. They warned of unrest and violence, but the security situation in Kashmir is better than before. And we'll go by data tonight, not rhetoric, to make this point. The number of law and order incidents in Kashmir has dropped drastically. Between 2017 and 2019, almost 1,400 incidents were reported, were registered. From August 2019 to July 2021, only 382 incidents have been registered. There has been a downturn in terror incidents too. Between 2017 and 2019, almost 700 terror-related incidents were reported. After the revocation of Article 370, only 350 such incidents have been reported. Terror recruitment too has fallen in the valley. In 2020, 167 Kashmiri youth joined terror ranks. In 2021, 73. That's a more than 50% decline. They say there will be no space for dialogue. That's what they said, that India will convert Kashmir into a Hindu state. Look at these images on your screen. 24th of June, all major political leaders from Kashmir met the Prime Minister in New Delhi. This included four former chief ministers of Kashmir and representatives from almost every major political party. They discussed the future political course of action in the region, including statehood and elections. The critics also said that there would be persistent unrest and little normalcy. Another image. Actor Amir Khan with Manoj Sinha, the Lieutenant Governor of Kashmir. They met a few days back to discuss ways to revive Kashmir's glory in Bollywood. And today the Lieutenant Governor launched the Jammu and Kashmir Film Policy, a concept that aims to promote local art and talent on a national scale through films and documentaries. It offers Kashmir's youth a chance to work in the Indian film industry. Will the Western media cover any of these developments? Or will they only feature stories that propagate fear and prejudice? We have a pattern here, you see. India gets bad international press and Pakistan, which is the root cause of most problems in Kashmir, is provided space to push its ag agenda and propaganda. Let me tell you how this nexus operates. The global Kashmir narrative is largely controlled by a set of US and UK based Kashmiri activists, so-called activists, most of them happen to be linked to the ISI and some also to the current U.S. administration. In the U.S., there's an organization called the Kashmiri American Council. It's a murky organization that is said to be central to pursuing Pakistan's Kashmir agenda. Its members are behind several anti-India op-eds that you see in Western newspapers. The council was founded in 1990 by this man, Ghulam Nabi Fai, an American citizen of Kashmiri origin. In 2011, Fai was arrested by America's Federal Bureau of Investigation, or FBI, for receiving funds from Pakistan's rogue spy agency. He was later released, and since then, he's been ramping up propaganda on Kashmir. Now, look at this image. September 2019, barely a month after India revoked Article 370, Ghulam Nabi Fai attended a meeting with Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan, a convicted ISI agent, openly meeting with the country's Prime Minister. What for? To diplomatically corner India on Kashmir, or try to do so at least. Here's something else you must know. The director of this body, the Kashmiri American Council, is Yusuf Fazili. Mr. Fazili is the father of Samira Fazili, a deputy assistant to the U.S. President and the deputy director of Biden's National Economic Council. Of course, her father's actions have no bearing on her professional record. But ISI agent Yusuf Fazili is also the father of Yusra Fazili, an American human rights lawyer who in November 2019 testified at a U.S. congressional hearing on the revocation of the special status of Jammu and Kashmir. The fact that such hearings occur in the U.S. is itself reprehensible. The inclusion of somebody linked to Pakistan's spy agency is worse. Meanwhile, in Pakistan, a rally was held in Islamabad today. They called it a solidarity walk for Kashmir, attended by the topmost leaders in the country, the foreign minister, the information and broadcasting minister, the interior minister, 
The Prime Minister was not present at this rally. He was busy tweeting on Kashmir. Busy putting out arguments that are so ironical they make you laugh. One of his tweets said this. India is destroying regional stability through its rogue actions and state-sponsored terrorism in contravention of all international laws and norms. Focus on the words used. Rogue action, state-sponsored terror and contravention of international law. I mean, who is Pakistan kidding here? Let me say this once again. Two years since Article 370 was revoked, Kashmir is marching to the tune of progress. The doomsday predictions and prophecies have proven wrong. And the nexus to defame India on Kashmir appears clearer than ever. And rounding off the day is a major military decision. The Indian Navy has deployed four warships to the South China Sea. No more observing the conflict. India wants a piece of the action. These warships will be deployed for two months. They will hold military drills with the democracies of the Indo-Pacific. This is a clear message to China. India is not looking east anymore. It is acting east. Here's a report. In 1991, India recalibrated its foreign policy. The days of Cold War were over. The economy was being unshackled. It was time to discover new frontiers. It was time to look east. Over three decades, India discovered and befriended Southeast Asia. But other regional powers had more sinister designs. While India sent cargo ships for trade, China was sending warships. The time for looking had clearly passed. It was now time to act east. Later this month, the Indian Navy will begin deployments in the South China Sea. Four ships will head to the region. A guided missile destroyer, a missile frigate, an anti-submarine corvette, and a guided missile corvette. This naval task force will visit Southeast Asia, South China Sea, and the Western Pacific. It promises to be a busy voyage for the Indian ships. They will hold joint exercises with Vietnam, the Philippines, Singapore and Indonesia. But the main event is the meet-up with Quad Nations. Navies from the US, Australia, Japan and India will join forces in the Indo-Pacific. The Quad may deny its military credentials, but these war games tell a different story. India is not content being an observer in the South China Sea. It wants in on the action. A sentiment reflected in the Indian Navy's mission statement. The deployment of the Indian Navy ship seeks to underscore the operational reach, peaceful presence and solidarity with friendly countries towards ensuring good order in the maritime domain. This voyage isn't about appeasing the court. It's about securing India's own interests in the region, pulling its own weight in the fight against China. Sample these numbers. India uses the South China Sea for trade worth $200 billion. 55% of India's Indo-Pacific business goes through here. So free navigation in the South China Sea isn't just a political objective. For India, there's a lot of money at stake. But China doesn't see it that way. From Beijing, they see a new armada sailing in every week. And the bad news is, all of them are allied against China. India's arrival will unsettle them even further. This is a country that seldom sends firepower into the Chinese backyard. But those equations have changed. China's actions along the land border have pushed India towards a more aggressive strategy. New Delhi is questioning and challenging China's piracy. On August 9th, Prime Minister Narendra Modi will share a UN Security Council debate on maritime security. The topic is global, but the focus is on the Indo-Pacific. The 1991 Look East policy was the nimble step of an emerging power. Three decades later, the Act East agenda is a stamp of authority. Whether it's battleship diplomacy or a high table discussion, India is ready and willing. Bureau Report, we on World is One. So while India looks east, it hasn't taken its eye off the west, more specifically Iran. Big day in Iran too. A new president took oath in Tehran today. His name is Ibrahim Raisi. He won the presidential election in June, a controversial one. Now he's in charge, 
A total of 115 officials from 73 countries were present at the oath-taking ceremony. This included 10 heads of state, 11 foreign ministers and 10 other ministers from different countries. But for us, there was one attendee who stood out. India's external affairs minister S. Jay Shankar. New Delhi is determined to go the extra mile, it seems, for a close relationship with Tehran. It wants to start on the right foot. So India's top diplomat is visiting Tehran to engage with the new Iranian president for the second time in less than a month. What explains this special focus? Why is India so proactively engaging with Iran and where is this relationship going? That's what we'll discuss in the next four minutes. India and Iran, as you know, have been historical allies. There's a lot going for the two of them. But in the current geopolitical scenario, their interests converge on two specific things, Afghanistan and Chabahar. Let's take up Afghanistan first. The Taliban's offensive is a matter of concern. As of July, the Taliban claims control of 90% of Afghanistan's borders. And that's a problem both for India and Iran. An unstable Afghanistan, you see, poses a direct security threat for Iran. As for India, the Taliban's rise could destabilize Jammu and Kashmir. So both India and Iran face the same threat, the threat of terrorism emanating from Afghanistan. What are they doing about it? Working closely, we are told. Reports say India and Iran have been coordinating their response in Afghanistan. Last month, External Affairs Minister Jay Shankar visited Tehran and met with Ibrahim Raisi, the same man who's taken out today. And this visit happened on the day when Iran was hosting talks between members of the Afghan government and the Taliban. Jay Shankar was the first foreign official to pay a visit to Raisi after his election victory. Reports say he conveyed a personal message from India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi to Ibrahim Raisi. He discussed Afghanistan with Iranian officials. And Tehran engaged in these high-level exchanges well before the oath-taking of the new president. This is a signal. It shows that Iran is eager to reciprocate to India's moves. Tehran has another reason to actively engage with New Delhi right now, and that is the Chabahar port. Yet again, mutual interest is the driving force behind these engagements. Iran needs more avenues for growth. Their economy is struggling. The country has been marred by protests over shortages of water and electricity, a whole host of problems. India can prove to be an important partner. Their interests converge on the Chabahar port. India sees Iran as a gateway to Afghanistan and to Central Asia. It wants a trade route to bypass Pakistan and that's where this port project, Chabahar, comes in. You see, Chabahar serves the objectives of both parties here. In recent weeks, Tehran and New Delhi have paid special attention to Chabahar. India has stepped up the development of the port. It is also promoting Chabahar as a viable alternative to the China-Pakistan economic corridor, the CPEC. A couple of weeks back, Minister Jay Shankar was at a conference in Tashkent. There he said that the Chabahar port will act as a hub for four countries, India, Uzbekistan, Iran and Afghanistan. A working group has been established to explore joint use of the Chabahar port between these four countries. The project is being opened up to more players and this is a win-win proposition both for India and Iran. Afghanistan and the Chabahar port, of course, are areas of two potential cooperation. There are many more, but these are good places to start. The new government of Iran is responding positively to India's outreach. Minister Jay Shankar is on a two-day visit to Tehran. He's scheduled to meet the new president again, Ibrahim Raisi. Both sides may have more to announce, and we'll keep track of what happens in Tehran for you. And like we said, Afghanistan will dominate the talks between the two countries. Here's an update from Kabul. The Afghan forces, it seems, have no idea as to what they should be doing with one of their biggest air bases. Before the Americans left, the Bagram airfield was the epicenter of the fight against the Taliban. But today, the same airbase is a ghost town. The Americans left in the dead of night. Now there are miles of unguarded roads and barracks inside. Vehicles are lying unused. And nearby shopkeepers are grabbing whatever they can from inside to sell as scrap. Our correspondent Anas Malik sent us this report. The U.S.'s departure from Bagram has raised the stakes in Afghanistan. 
This strategic air base is currently serving as an Afghan Armed Forces military base. Situated 50 kilometers north of the capital, Kabul, it was formerly the largest U.S. military base in Afghanistan. On July 2nd, the U.S. and its allies exited Bagram Air Base. It served as the centerpiece of their presence in Afghanistan and a launch pad for U.S. operations. Now the Afghan government forces are embroiled in an intense battle with the Taliban across the nation as they make rapid inroads. And amid all the turmoil, guards in body armor can be seen patrolling the heavily fortified entrance to Bagram, a favorite target for suicide bombers over the years. They says helicopters clatter overhead to keep a hawkeye on the base. On the outer wall of the Bagram Air Base lies a market which deals in scrap. Scrap that has been collected or brought from Bagram, repaired and then sold off. But the dealers have their own set of worries and complaints. It's not in the hands of Americans to give us business. From the time they have left, their disposed things have been bought by us to sell so that the enemy doesn't get their hands on it. This includes their cars and other things. Whatever we bought, we will repair this and sell it to the market. The Americans' purpose was the same, that whatever they are leaving behind is left behind in a way that nobody is able to use it. As we move further into the base, we see a pile of machines in the backyard. These have been recovered from the Bagram Air Base when the U.S. vacated it. All around are heaps of junk and scrap, ranging from telephones and thermos flasks to computer keyboards and printer cartridges, from shoes to workout machines. I'm standing right outside the Bagram Air Base. This is the outer wall to the air base. Beyond this, another 2.5 kilometers inside is where all the operations used to take place. On the outer wall, there is a market, the market that deals in scrap materials. The shop key owners over here say and believe that the U.S. exit has in a way benefited them, given that the influx of their scrap has increased Anas Malik in Bagram, Afghanistan for Vion World is One. Let me ask you a quirky question. What completes a traveler's ensemble? That one thing you see every tourist carrying. It's not a camera, it's not a hat. It's a water bottle. The humble bottle of mineral water, you simply can't do without it, especially with the temperatures rising everywhere. They're cheap, you can get them at any shop, and after a tough day of wandering around, it tastes extra special. But what's the cost of bottled water? And I'm not talking about the price tag, I'm talking about the cost to the environment. We know the bottles are single-use plastics, you drink and dump them. They don't contain natural minerals either. Most of it is added at a factory. The companies may have advertisements with waterfalls and forest streams, but that's not where bottled water comes from. It's a factory product, which means there is a cost to the environment. Thanks to a new study in Barcelona, we know what that cost is. The impact of bottled water on the ecosystem is 1,400 times the impact of tap water. Let me put it differently. Assume that everyone in Barcelona drank only bottled water, no tap water. Then the cost of resource extraction would be 3,500 times higher. In money terms, that's almost $84 million per year. And remember, this is for one city of 1.6 million people. Imagine the global scale. The obvious question here is, isn't tap water unhealthy for us? Well, broadly speaking, it is, yes. Treated tap water contains a compound called THM, that's trihalomethanes. There is scientific evidence that THM causes bladder cancer. So why should you keep drinking it? For starters, authorities regulate the THM levels in your water, plus abandoning bottled water, by abandoning it, you create an envi a better environment. Now, the researchers in Barcelona say that this offsets the risk of bladder cancer. I know it sounds complicated, so let me try again. 
Most people drink bottled water because they think it is healthy. By producing bottled water, but producing bottled water rather. So what you're gaining by drinking bottled water, you're toxic. It's a bit of a zero-sum game. Take the United States, for example. The bottled water industry uses 17 million more fumes, more pollution. In Britain, the bottled, bottled water is five. hundred times more expensive than tap water. What kind of ads they make. Free bottle of water. Comes straight from the Himalayas. What about the marketing on the other side? There is none. No government is marketing tap water. There is nothing attractive or special about it. But maybe it's time for marketing counter, a marketing counter-offensive. The first step is creating the infrastructure, installing more public fountains, putting more taps in street corners and public buildings. The second, most countries, tap water is a one-way. Recently, the city of Puri in India declared drink. The central government has made this a national method. The marketing can begin. And that's where we, the people, come in. Difficult. Well, that attitude is hurting the environment. So next time you start step out, take a bottle with you. And when you're out of water, find a tap to top up. Because the so-called humble mineral water is not so humble after all. And here's a big story from Africa. The Ethiopian civil war has turned into a state-sponsored bloodbath, it seems. Nine months ago, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed promised a swift victory. Today, dead bodies are washing up in neighboring countries. Refugee camps are on the brink of collapse. But the Prime Minister is keeping aid agencies out. His apathy and ruthlessness is pushing Tigray towards a famine. Here's a report. Deep in the Horn of Africa, the horrors of Ethiopia's forgotten war are resurfacing. What was supposed to be a swift victory has descended into a lengthy bloodbath. One that has turned Tigray's mountains, forests and rivers into graveyards. <laughs> this is Tekeze River. Over its 600-kilometer journey, this river nourishes much of Ethiopia. But today, it's a grim reminder of this cruel war. Downstream in Sudan, dozens of corpses are floating in the river. Some of them are riddled with gunshots. Others were found with their hands tied behind. This isn't a war casualty. It is mass murder. The bodies were first spotted by fishermen in Sudan. They recovered at least 50 of them. But some were washed away by the strong currents, possibly lost forever. We found that man with his hands tied with a red plastic cord. Everyone else was tied with yellow electric cables. None of them had identifying documents on them. These people were in Humera, but they are not from there. They are from Tigray. Tekeze's ghosts are likely Tigrayan refugees, people who tried to flee the battle, only to be captured and killed by the Ethiopian army. The government denies this version. They say it's a fake campaign by propagandists. This has been Ethiopia's answer to all atrocities. Deny it ever happened. But these pictures don't lie. The refugee camps in Tigray are running out of food and water. More than 100,000 children are at risk of death. The United Nations wants to help, but the government won't let them. Yes, above, uh, yes, one thing is fine. We need to change the circumstances that have seen trucks moving in rather slowly. We need assured access routes by land, as well as, of course, uh, our own flights going in and out of Mekele. And frankly, we need the war to end. We need the conflict to stop. 
if this is to be a safe place for the people of those particular regions in northern Ethiopia. The United States has dispatched U.S. aid chief Samantha Powers to Ethiopia. Washington has dumped money on this conflict, but it's done little to end the war. Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed continues to block aid and intervention. He hides behind his Nobel Prize as his countrymen starve to death. Bureau Report, we on World is One. Should schools reopen? Some say they shouldn't, others say they should. Some states have already reopened schools in India. This includes Punjab, Uttarakhand, Chhattisgarh, Gujarat, Haryana, Madhya Pradesh and Himachal Pradesh. And most of these states' uh, schools have been reopened for selected classes, mostly senior classes, grade 9 and above. In Himachal Pradesh, for example, schools have reopened for classes 10 to 12. But in most Indian states, schools are still closed. And they have been closed for more than 500 days now. The Wuhan virus was declared a pandemic 17 months ago in March 2020. And since March 2020, over 250 million primary and middle school children have not stepped into their classrooms. This is the situation in India. And while all of these numbers are true, and they say a lot, they do not necessarily translate into a safety certificate for schools. They do not mean reopening schools is now safe. Those arguing in favor of reopening cite instances of bars and shopping malls, even marriage halls, they're all open. They've all reopened, why not schools, they say. Well, for one, schools are for children, and children have not been vaccinated. Most of them are below 18 years of age. In India, they do not qualify for Wuhan virus vaccination. So sending them to school unvaccinated will mean risking their lives, exposing them to the virus. Will parents be okay with that? I'm a parent and I know I wouldn't be. I would rather wait it out. I would wait till I know for sure that my kids will be safe at school. And right now they won't be. The pandemic has not gone away. If anything, cases are rising in many parts of the world. And in India, a third wave is on the horizon. That said, I realize I'm speaking from a position of privilege here. Some children have access to digital learning. They can afford to attend classes from home. Many others can't. Many students and teachers in India cannot afford a smartphone, a laptop, a computer. Many schools lack basic infrastructure required for conducting online classes. Computers, for example. Let me show you some numbers. In Assam, just 13% of schools have a working computer. In Madhya Pradesh, again, only 13%. 14% in Bihar, 14 in West Bengal, 15 in Tripura, 18% in Uttar Pradesh. 18% schools have computers. How are they managing to, to conduct classes in the middle of a pandemic? How are students enrolled in these schools managing to keep up with their studies? Oxfam India carried out a survey in 2020. It interviewed nearly 1,200 parents and 500 teachers. They were all from the Indian states of Odisha, Bihar, Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh and UP. 80% of these parents said that their children had not received any education during the pandemic. Four out of five students had not received their textbooks for the academic year. Teachers feared that 30% of their students might not return to classes when schools reopen. There is no doubt that school closure is taking a toll on education. It is also threatening to undo the gains made in the education sector in general. The facility deficit in government-funded schools does not help. Let me show you more numbers. At least 113 million students attend government schools in India. Some 65% of these students from 20 states are enrolled in them, in government schools. But only 30% of these schools have functional computers. This is according to the Education Ministry. The Education Ministry data also says that in the run-up to the pandemic, less than 12% of India's government schools had internet facilities. What about private schools? The numbers are not reassuring, even if we account for them. As we speak, only three states in India have internet facilities in majority of their schools, which are these states, Kerala, Delhi and Gujarat. So you're not wrong if you believe that schools should reopen, that every child should be able to access learning. Of course they should. Education, after all, is every child's right. And the pandemic should not be allowed to snatch away that right. 
So yes, they should go back to school. But you see, there's a problem. Our children will not be safe, not yet. Our minds may convince us that school is worth the risk. But our tryst with the pandemic shows us that nothing is worth risking the Wuhan virus. The last one year has been a grand experiment. We have tried alternate day work from home. We have tried alternate seatings at restaurants, movie halls, alternate flights of escalator stairs. We've tried all kinds of things. I think we should leave children out of this grand experiment. That's my opinion, nonetheless. We're wrapping up the show on that. Leaving you as always with Gravitas Images. Thanks very much for watching.